Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. The ninth Sunday after Pentecost falls on August 7th, 2022. And the biblical texts are these. The complimentary first reading is Genesis 15, 1 through 6, while the semi-continuous first reading is Isaiah 1, verse 1, and then verses 10 through 20. Psalm 33, 12 through 22, Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, and then 8 through 16, and Luke 12, 32 through 40. Still in Luke, we got two Sundays in a row from the earliest parts of Isaiah, and then four Sundays in a row back to Hebrews. We did some Hebrews back in the fall, but had to stop for things like Advent. And now we're uh, back in Hebrews. But Luke, this is, um, yeah, this is, if, if you get, if you keep thinking like, when is he going to stop talking about money and wealth and nervousness and worry and devotion? Um, the short answer is not quite yet. No. Anymore. Right. But here's the thing. This passage starts off with one of the most beautiful sentences in all of Luke's gospel. So for all of the difficulty, all of the, oh my goodness, the rich ruler has to give away everything, Zacchaeus and the, uh, all these characters. And he says things like, if you don't give away all your wealth, you can't be my disciple. And, you know, he sets the bar so high here. You've got, do not be afraid that will flock for it is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could read that twice if you want. Then there's commands. There's ways to live that out. And they're all hard and they're all uncomfortable but it's all predicated under or flows out of this promise of the father's good pleasure is just a great line. Yeah. And also the fact that, not that you do necessarily have to add verses here, but we talked about this a couple of weeks ago where with Mary and Martha and that, uh, and that, you know, Martha was worried about many things. And we talked about that as a theme. And then, in 1222, you get that. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. And then you get those, those promises uh, that then, uh, then do not be afraid really even rings true even more that God's, you know, the father's good pleasure is, uh, it, it, you know, is to feed uh, the ravens, it's it's to end the birds, and it's to uh, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, and so that's the pleasure piece too, of what of how we hear this is, and so I think the the preacher also wants to go back to that language too. What is what is God's what is God's good pleasure look like? That's what it is, and uh, and and yeah, to go to go to 22 verses 30, 20, 12, 22 through 31 gives you the language for that. Well, it's also to serve dinner to his slaves, which is a shocking image given the cultural context. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's an important theme as well, that overturning of conventional norms, which we saw uh, obviously in Mary's song in the Magnificat. And so that's this is a moment where that's coming to uh, coming to bear, you know, it's bearing true of this is what this kingdom is all about. And that's one of the identifiers then of the kingdom. I also, and I can never read this and not like start singing. If Rolf were here, we'd start singing, you know, that have no fear, little flock. Have no fear, little flock. Have no fear, little flock. You know that one? For the Father has chosen to give you the kingdom. Have no fear little flock and then it's have good cheer little uh -huh. have good cheer. anyway i will stop there but that can be your hymn of the day there you are we have a hymn okay there it is okay yeah yeah, yeah. uh familiar text uh um uh and i um I, I have to point to the um, to the commentary, um, not just because uh, she references a movie, uh, but 
<laughs> but uh, also, I, I really like this focus uh, uh, that uh, Jerusha Neal makes uh, on the return of the Son of Man as, and this is paralleling uh, the movie uh, that she references, a similar rescue mission, a mission to wake the world and free the dead. Um, and compared to all the fictional, fictional dystopian warnings that we have, what is it at the end that is happening here? And it's in verse 40 that we must be ready for the son of man is coming at an unexpected hour. And what will happen is that because of that promise, we're not waiting to see the return in the sky. We're living as if that kingdom of God is here on earth, which uh, I appreciate you're bringing in uh, the verses uh, from uh, the earlier verses here in verse 12, because it indeed uh, describes that and puts in context. How do we have this hope? And if we have this hope, how, how then do we live? Yeah. And I think it also uh, ties back to some of the things that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks that, it, the, you know, the fact that the, the master, you know, hosts this, hosts the meal here, uh, uh, that the, um, uh, that service is that it is that sense of that faithful service in the present moment, you know, yes. recognizing that, you know, since the kingdom of God is here near and here, uh, then that attentiveness in the moment, that attentiveness in the, in that press, in that presence. Uh, and, uh, and there's a, there's the immediacy or the urgency of that response here. And now I think it's another, again, going back to some of the themes that we've been tracing over the last couple of weeks. Exactly. Well noted. The Genesis pairing, I guess, in the complimentary Old Testament reading, I assume is just about a promise making God, right? Who, mm. who, um, which I don't mean to dismiss is just about that. But this idea of Abraham, Abram at this point in the story yeah. being met by just a promise like, hey, you should go outside and look at the stars because mm -hmm. that's how numerous your descendants are going to be, mm -hmm. right? And count the star. I, you have to imagine God kind of grinning in all of this. Like I could just tell him, I could give him a number, but I think instead <laughs> I'm going to go tell him to count the stars. I think I'm going to make it a particularly cloudless night. You know what I mean? There's just a kind of joy with, with the, the gift giver. Yeah. The good pleasure. Yeah. yeah. It's an act of good pleasure um in that and and that good pleasure uh the that i don't know that discovery of that characteristic of god perhaps um you know going back to your attraction to that phrase matt of good you know father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom i uh, and that uh and that you see that kind of pleasure here in the in the Genesis text as well. And in the midst of this, there's the delayed gratification. It's, it, you know, why is this invitation to consider the fullness of this yet revealed, uh, yet experienced pr promise is because Abram is saying, look, you, 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 you said I was going to get something, and I don't got it. You said, I'm going to have a child and I don't have a child. We're getting older. And, you know, the closest thing I've got, you know, isn't, isn't what you're promising. And that's exactly what God says. Nope, that isn't what I'm promising. Um, and, and, and it is in the midst of that doubt. It is in the midst of that um, um, where Abram could, to think about the text from uh, last week, where Abram could say, I've 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 built this answer in 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 my slave's uh, child, um, and God is saying no. Let let me let pause. Let me have you pause and experience the splendor of all that I am doing, so that you can trust that the promise that I make you is going to be just that splendid. And and to, so before we experience the beauty. Um, um, which I just love the image that you painted, Matt, but before we experience that, to maybe linger in, um, it's dark. <laughs> you know, the only way you're going to get to see those stars is the day has to end. The work has to stop. Um, the sun has to go down. Mm -hmm. And yet God is still providing 
what is marvelous and you can trust. Yeah. And another, you know, another translation of uh, another possible translation of good pleasure is uh, enjoyment. Mm -hmm. God's God's enjoyment, right, is uh, is what this is about here too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll and come back to Abraham, I'm sure, when we talk about Hebrews, but oh, go ahead, Joy. Sorry. Yeah. Well, no, I was just going to use a, a offer a, a story. Um, my uncle, um, I grew up on, in the city in Chicago, and my uncle moved his family back to Mississippi. Um, I don't know when I was probably about uh, 10 or something like that, and um, or, or maybe a little bit older. But anyway, we went to visit them, and my youngest cousin basically grew up down there. And um, so I walked out one night in the sky, you, you know, the city lights are gone, and I can see all the stars. And my cousin wanted to go in the house and play. And I remember saying to him, don't you remember when you first moved down here? Don't you remember how beautiful the stars were? And his response to me was this, yeah, but they're out there every night. Mm -hmm. How many times do we forget all that God is providing us because we want to rush off to play the games that we want to play? And, and so um, I just offer that um, in terms of, you know, pausing to, to enjoy, mm -hmm. uh, to find that pleasure. Isaiah, I have a feeling that Joy's ready to go with Isaiah one, because <laughs> Isaiah is your favorite book, if I recall correctly. It, you're right, and this 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 first chapter always uh, reads like an ancient broadcast of MNBC, and by that I mean Middle Eastern News Broadcast Channel. Um, 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 we we have beloved worship practices that have nothing to do with honoring or surrendering or bringing a witness to the creator God. And we have these regularly scheduled festivals or, or uh, events that I ha have become a distraction for the people of God, um, for the very God that they're supposed to be worshiped. We have these programs and, and gatherings that, are, that so completely occupy the imagination of the children, whether it, that's so completely occupies our imagination that the children, whether they are refugees or in poverty, are dismissed. The homeless, whether they are physically without shelter or emotionally without community, are disregarded. The words of this first chapter speak a harsh reality to our congregations where we are listening to the news today that says, we are not practicing. The church is not being the place of justice, the place of concern for the poor, the displaced, the widows, the orphans. And man, that's a hard word and it's a true word. And Isaiah just names it. And I'm going to say again, um, it's a hard word to preach if we preach it. And maybe the only way to do it is to have the finesse of putting it back into its ancient context of the people of Judah under the leadership of Ahaz and Hezekiah, Israel, Israelite kings, their people who have not encouraged the people to be a witness to, and a servant of the God of their ancestors. So their guys are in power and they are not practicing what their God has called them to do. And that's a challenge to us, no matter who's in the White House or who we voted for. Uh, the church is to still be a demonstration of the justice and presence of God. And Isaiah names it. And uh, that's a word for us to claim. What is that distinctiveness? What will people, what do, what do people observe? What do they see? And then and you and it's it's so like verse 17 well beginning with the end of uh 16 cease to do evil learn to do good seek justice rescue the oppressed defend the orphan plead for the widow right I there do, people yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Yeah. Rescue the perish is the song. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to sing it, but uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a good one to sing uh, with this text. Rescue the perish, perishing. 
such a scathing indictment and then the ending is uh, you know if you read enough of the prophets you expect it but the the, the promise of mercy or at least a chance yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and because of that bless you Matt. and because of that promise i'm not willing to blame this on god I, I, I read this as God judging human failure to practice community rather than the loss of community as being caused by God. And, and so that, that, yeah, that promise uh, is, is God's faithfulness in saying, look, you, we are to bear God's image in the world. And it's, it's the practice of hospitality that if in these previous weeks you've been focusing on, this, this is a text that is asking us to practice that hospitality. Yeah, and I, I think too, I mean, maybe we could even bring the psalm in here as well, but it's, you know, it, it, it's, there are questions of distinctiveness and identity of call, vocation, of, of embodying this relationship that Israel has with God and the world, and that's also true for, uh, for, you know, the audiences of, or the congregations of Paul, but it's true, of course, for the Lucan text, but it's 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 for the that integrity of or that correlation between that that relationship with God that then manifests itself in who we are and how we are, and and then not only that but like it with the Luke text and what you were talking about, Joy. It's it's for the sake of pleasure, happiness, and enjoyment for all. Like that's what we get in the Psalm, right? Yeah. Path is the nation whose God is the Lord, uh, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven and he sees all. And so in verse 21, our heart is glad, you know, that, that sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes of course the prophets, they, that harsh word that they speak uh, is uh, obviously heard as a <laughs> harsh word of truth, but it's for the sake of bringing back to relationship. Uh, and it's for the sake of that, of, of uh, embodying that relationship, but it's for the sake of, of pleasure and wholeness and joy and enjoyment and happiness. And that that's, that's what God wants for us. Uh, so that's why we bring in the psalm here, and and mm -hmm. to uh, and how how easy it is for us to look over, you know, when we hear that word, look over the pleasure and the enjoyment and the happiness and the goodness, and that's. that's and I want to thank I want to thank you, Caroline, for reading verse thirteen as well as verse twelve because we can get caught in the happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people who God has chosen. Mm -hmm. But, but the next all. verse says, the Lord looks down and sees all. And, and you know, we, we got that a couple of weeks ago in Colossians is, is God's intent has always been mm -hmm. a promise through a people for all people. And, and so thanks for not overlooking that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's part of it, right? That's the, that's the, the pleasure uh, is interconnected. The goodness, the enjoyment, the happiness, the gladness is inter interconnected with uh, God's commitment to all of humankind and the cosmos. Mm -hmm. so, we can't, we can't, we don't get that. We don't get to keep that for ourselves. <laughs> it's and and that, that's an echo of if, you know, we talked about what does it mean uh, from um, uh, Luke 11 to store up for ourselves and lose the fact that our blessing is to be a blessing for others, which was that promise given to Abram in, in Genesis 12. They, they, this is a, a, a continuous run. Uh, um, I, I, you, you teased me earlier, I just uh, finished binge watching um, the uh, Agents of the Shield and um, it, it circles back, but you don't know it until you get to the very end. And that's what's happening through scripture. The promise of God is always before us and we're all 
always circling back to the creator God who has created this playground for humanity to enjoy life to its fullest. Should we move to Hebrews then? Let's do it. First of four weeks, this is a much more enjoyable part of Hebrews than trying to explain to people who Melchizedek was. <laughs> yeah, these are kind of, yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of the best, you know, what is it? The um, best, uh, best lines of Hebrews. I mean, a lot of people are very, very familiar, right? With now faith is the insurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. And every time we get phrases like this that end up on plaques and placards and things and, you know, that decorate offices and such, I always sort of pull back and say, this is, this is an opportunity to put that verse back in its context and say, what, what is, what is the author of Hebrews saying here and why here? And, I uh, and, and, and Here's, a, here's your opportunity. Yes. Yes. And, and the description, uh, if we talk about the happiness, we talk about the pleasure, we talk about um, the community, we talk about the relationships, we talk about all the promises that we've been looking at in the other text. Uh, this is not, uh, this is a, heaven, a heavenly description, not a destination. Uh, so this isn't the end, this is in the moment. Uh, again, something we talked about uh, earlier. And I wonder what it might be uh, as a glimpse of, of God's presence um, that those of us, that those who come behind us would report of our testimony of God's goodness the way this chapter reports on this cloud of witnesses. And that's not gonna happen because we have this hope. It's gonna happen because we live in this hope. Well, and the idea of living is so important, Joy, that it's um, the, my favorite part of the, the emphases here in chapter 11, it happens here, it happens again at the end of the chapter, which we'll see next week. This idea that all these people died without seeing what was promised, that everybody lives in this kind of incompleteness and yet the journey continues and it outlives all of them. I, um, a, there was a class I teach regularly but just actually finished teaching it in the fall probably for the last time because my, my co-teacher has moved on to a different job but uh we assign a, a chapter from uh Dorte Zola's book the mystery of death the German theologian where she talks about the importance of contrasting Abraham's journey with the journey of the great heroes of the epics like Odysseus right whose journey is about going out conquering and coming back mm -hmm. Well, Abraham's journey is about a promise at the end and it goes in a straight line. And that's, she said, that's for people of faith and in her particular book for Christians, that's how you view death. It's not a homecoming, right? It's a moving into now a new stage, a new part of the journey. And so that's, you know, when Hebrews gets back to that language of a great cloud of witnesses, which will come, mm -hmm. come shortly, um, that's, that's part of it. It's not to see a people cheering you on, but you have you have forerunners, right? That you've got, you're in, I don't want to use a, like a relay race metaphor, but you know, I mean, you've got kind of your, your part and you're accompanied and you're, but you're, you're preceded by courage. Uh, you're preceded by faithfulness, but you're also preceded by this line about a desire for a better country yeah. right? a better time, a better place, a better society. Mm -hmm. uh, which is what makes faith look so ridiculous <laughs> to so many people, right? Because it, it is, we look so naive in the eyes of so many. Um, but that's what I believe, right? So how do you how do you find that kinship with Sarah, with Abraham, as as a journeying people or as an itinerant people? Mm 